What's going on, guys? My name is Steve. Thank you for stopping by my channel. I'm just an American guy on a journey to discover my British and Irish ancestry. Today, we're going to be reacting to the British Crown Jewels, a journey through history. I think the first time I actually really noticed the Crown Jewels were when they were sitting on Queen Elizabeth II's coffin at the end of her funeral. And when they placed these items on the three pillows at the end there, I was just noticing how beautiful and intricate the details of these items were. And it just got me kind of curious about kind of how old they are and, you know, how many kings and queens have wore these items and used these items and uh, what the value of them are. And, and kind of like at the time, I didn't even know what all three items were called. I obviously knew this was a crown that's in front of us right now. But, you know, I also learned that there was a scepter and the orb. And I'm kind of curious what the meaning behind, you know, especially the scepter and the orb are. To me, I would I would expect the crown simply as a way to kind of separate, you know, and kind of acknowledge the monarch as having, you know, this this amazing power, if you will. Um, but I'm not really sure what the scepter and the orb are really, you know, what they mean. So anyways, guys, so I thought we would go ahead and check out kind of a little bit about the history of it because that'll give me a good idea of kind of where these come from and and hopefully a lot more information and uh, this would be a good place to start to learn about the uh, British Crown Jewels. So let's go ahead and check out the Crown Jewels, A Journey Through History. Those are so beautiful. Look at that. It the looks... Crown Jewels. A that, journey through history. They're so beautiful, they look almost fake because you, you just can't imagine for sponsoring this video. All those jewels being the together crown, like that. Like the very symbol of power, wow. wealth, majesty, and royalty. It is a shining golden signal to the medieval mud caked peasantry that here is a person who is above them and blessed from above. I guess that's true, yeah. In the Middle Ages, a mere mortal man was seen to mystically transform into a mighty monarch by having a crown placed upon his head. I mean, is that really true? Is that the way people in the past would have looked at that? Is like a, like she said, a mortal man, a regular man, all of a sudden gets the, has the ceremony, has this crown placed on their head, and all of a sudden it transforms them into something beyond mortal men? Is that kind of, I don't know that that's, obviously I don't think that's how people look at, for example, King Charles, but is that how people perceive the king, you know, in past centuries? That he went from a mortal man to more of a kind of like a godlike figure? Um, that is kind of a perception I would have when I look at some of like the art and whatnot from the past of kings. Um, but yeah, anyways, let's go ahead and continue. You can't be a king without the bling. Kings, queens, and emperors around the world have used crowns and also scepters, orbs, robes, and other gold, silver, and bejeweled pieces of regalia Makes sense. as a central part of their coronation ceremonies for centuries. Today, the handful of remaining monarchies in Europe have consigned their crown jewels to museums and have moved to more modest, secular swearing-in ceremonies. But in Britain, the myth and majesty of monarchy wow, is still very much in practice. The diamond encrusted <sighs> imperial state crown. Oh man, I want to see that from the top. Like, hold on. Wow. It's just surreal to me. Like, you're telling me all these individual sparkly little pieces are diamonds. That has, to, I mean, how valuable is this crown? I can't even imagine. It's, I guess these blue are sapphire, and I think there were rubies along here. And are, I think these are pearls, if I'm not mistaken. And is it silver or is it, no, I think it's, I don't know. If it's, is there gold or silver or both in here? It's just, Wow. The diamond-encrusted imperial state crown is paraded out each year when the Queen opens Parliament. And the regalia will be a central part of the next coronation when the time comes. Let's take a look at the 1500-year history of the British crown jewels. They have been washed away in the sea, stolen from a grave, 
sold off to pay princely debts, melted down to make coins, and pilfered from countries across the globe to end up on the heads of Britain's kings and queens. Wait, melted down? So are they saying that the current crown, scepter, and orb aren't the original ones? I mean, that makes sense. I mean, this 15 year, 1500 year history is a long time for uh, these items to last without having some changes, obviously, or disappearing in some way, I guess, uh, from time to time. But so they've actually melted down the crown jewels to create coins. I'd like to know about that story because that's, I mean, how many coins are you going to create from these few items? It just seems kind of odd that that would take place. Crowns, diadems, and other headdresses have been used around the world since ancient times as a symbol of the power and dignity of rulers. In early Christian Europe, a new king was proclaimed when a religious official placed a crown upon his head in a coronation ceremony. The crown represented a halo and the oh. monarch's divine right to rule. That makes In 597, sense. Pope Gregory I sent a monk, St. Augustine, to Britain to convert the pagans to Christianity. Augustine became the first Archbishop of Canterbury, and he introduced the coronation ceremony to England. Initially, new kings had a helmet rather than a crown placed upon their head. This okay, this is kind of like more, I guess you'd say, kind of fighting armor, you know, if you will. Uh, which is, uh, that does, I feel like in past centuries, you know, kings were much more involved in battle. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but that's, that's the perception I have. This was fitting as war was how medieval kings won and kept their power. The king would also be anointed with holy oil in a church, demonstrating their God-given right to rule. When the king died, his coronation regalia was buried with him, and a new set was made for his successor. Back on the continent, on Christmas Day in the year 800, Charlemagne was crowned Emperor of the Romans, when Pope Leo III placed a golden crown upon his head. From then on, a golden crown became all the rage for rulers okay. across Europe. In 924, Ethelstan was the first king to unite all of England under his rule. He was also the first English king depicted wearing a golden crown Ooh. in this illuminated manuscript from Bede's Life of St. Cuthbert. In 973, his nephew, Edgar the Peaceful, was the first English king to have a coronation with an actual crown. He also introduced the scepter, a symbol of power dating back to ancient Egypt, which in Christianity was derived from the shepherd's crook carried by bishops, oh. and represents the monarch's religious leadership. Edgar's wife, Elftherith, was the first queen of... Okay, so, so real quick to... Okay, so the crown is basically represented as a halo that gives them divine right to um, to rule. And the scepter is uh, a sign that they have the right to... Hold on. Scepter, a symbol of power dating back to ancient uh. Egypt, which in Christianity was derived from the shepherd's crook carried by bishops, and represents the monarch's religious leadership. Okay, represents Edgar's his religious wife, re leadership. Elfthereth, was okay. the first queen of England to be crowned in an official coronation. So a crown for the queen consort also became part of the royal regalia. Okay. King Edward the Confessor is depicted with a crown and scepter in the first scene of the Bayou Tapestry. He died in 1066 without an heir, opening the door for William the Conqueror and the Norman invasion. Oh, okay. King William used the symbolism of the crown to cement his authority over his new subjects, and was sure to wear it when he visited England for the religious festivals of Easter, Whitsun, and Christmas. William and his descendants likely continued the tradition of being buried with their crowns, while some regalia was passed down and some made new for each new king. In 1216, King John was at war with his own people. 
After taxing them to starvation to enrich himself, he was furious at having been forced to sign the Magna Carta, the first constitution mm. which limited his power oh. and gave rights to his barons. While on the march- I've still got to look at all that. I, there's so much history in the UK and Ireland as well, obviously, um, that I really, I, I'm so lost because there's so much that the history I have looked at, you know, it's hard to remember all of it. It's, it's, it's just so in depth. So um, definitely need to uh, go deeper and learn about some of these kings, you know, things like the Magna Carta signing and things like that. To smash his people into submission, John took a shortcut and led his army across an estuary known as the Wash. He made a fatal miscalculation with the tides. While his men were marching across the narrow strip of dry land, the water suddenly rose and they were trapped. Many oh. soldiers, horses, and carts filled with the king's ill-gotten gains were washed out to Ooh, sea wow. or swallowed up in quicksand and tidal whirlpools. Much of King John's wealth remains at the bottom of the North Sea, including his crown jewels. Are you serious? As no inventory of King John's possessions exist, it is unclear exactly what was included in the crown jewels he lost. But it Oh my, so has there been any expeditions? I, I guess there have been to go and try to find those. That's crazy. If you could find, if you could find that, that would be so valuable. Wow. Was enough to send the king into a deep depression. He drowned his sorrows in the kegs of a nearby abbey. The monk's brew gave him dysentery and he died. Wow. John's son, Henry III, was now king, but he needed a new crown. And with all his family wealth now at the bottom of the North Sea, he couldn't afford to have a fresh crown forged. So Henry looked to the past. King Edward the Confessor had recently been canonized as a saint, and thus any objects connected with him were transformed into powerful holy relics. In order to capitalize on this golden opportunity, the monks at Edward's burial place of Westminster Abbey claimed that the royal saint had asked them to look after his crown and regalia in perpetuity, and that they were to be used in the coronations of all future kings. Strangely, no one thought to mention this bequest for 250 years. The monks produced a letter supposedly from St. Edward, as well as a gold wirework crown set with small stones and decorated with filigree and cloisonné enamel and two little bells. There was another smaller crown of state for the king to wear at important events, a crown for the queen consort, and That's scepter, an interesting looking two crown rods, there. rings, an onyx chalice for communion, and several other holy vestments. These objects were almost certainly stolen from King Edward's grave. But the monk's claim coincided perfectly with King Henry's need mm. for a crown. So Edward's burial loot became the first known set of hereditary coronation regalia in Europe. It wow, so that was the first. Was What year was that? I'll figure that out later. But um, So that was the first hereditary passed down of, 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 crown, of uh, the crown jewels from that point on, I guess. It was used in the coronation of England's medieval kings for hundreds of years, wow. thus cementing the legacy and holy supremacy of these precious objects. But as the holy crown was not permitted to be taken out of Westminster Abbey, kings had other crowns made to wear on holidays, uh. state occasions, and in battle. And they saved St. Edward's crown only for coronations. While you may not be keeping a historic and priceless collection of crown jewels in your home, <laughs> you do have possessions and more importantly, people you want to keep safe. But most home security systems come with excessive upfront and long-term costs. We're not considering crown jewel history. 
Up to this point, kings were not considered to have begun their reign until the moment the crown was placed upon their head by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Oh, okay. But okay. when Henry III died, his son and heir, now King Edward I, named in honor of the saint, was away on crusade and wasn't able to make it back to England for another two years. So he was proclaimed King of England in Sicily upon learning of his father's death. From then on, the coronation remained an important symbol, but a new monarch's ascension is marked from the moment of their predecessor's death. Mm, okay. Once King Edward made it back to Britain, he set about conquering both Wales and Scotland. He claimed their role. So what happened then, like if, if one king died and then the other one couldn't be crowned right away, what happened in that period of time, generally speaking? Uh, since they weren't technically able to, they weren't technically looked at as the king until they were crowned. That's interesting. Royals crowned jewels and added them to his own. The crown supposedly owned by the legendary King Arthur was pilfered from Wales, and the mystical stone of Scone was stolen from Scotland and placed in the English coronation chair. While some kings added to the treasure trove, others chipped away at it to pay off their debts. Edward II pawned his great crown in Flanders. Edward III pawned gave it. three crowns to the Bishop of London and the Earl of Arndell as security for a £10,000 loan, about £12.6 million today. You know, this is something interesting that I think a lot of people in America probably don't comprehend. And that's the fact that kings haven't always had this mass amount of wealth. Sometimes kings have been broke. And that's something I'm learning now that like throughout my life, when I thought, you know, someone says a king or queen, you just automatically assume they are just like basically the wealthiest people in the world, you know, but I've definitely learned that that hasn't always been the case. And then, and then like, Kind of like with Queen Elizabeth and or the current monarch in Britain, a lot of their wealth, they are very wealthy, but a lot of their wealth is actually owned by the people themselves, which is something that's kind of surprising to me. Sometimes these precious objects were temporarily lent back to the monarch to be used in coronations or other state occasions uh, okay. and then taken back after the ceremony. In the 1300s, yeah. after a series so of beautiful. attempted and successful thefts in Westminster Abbey, the crown jewels were moved to the White Tower in the Tower of London for safekeeping. The collection is housed there to wow. this day. In 1399, King Richard II was forced to abdicate and hand St. Edward's crown to his cousin, Henry IV. Richard said, I present to you this crown and all the rights dependent on it. Henry IV added two arches topped with a mound and cross to St. Edward's crown, thus transforming it from a royal crown to an imperial crown. Oh. The additions signify that the wearer is an emperor in his own domain, subservient oh. to no one but God, wow. rather than a lesser king who owes fealty to a more powerful ruler, like the kings in the Holy Roman Empire. Wow. In 1485, at the Battle of Bosworth Field, King Richard III received a fatal head wound. According to legend, his crown was found under a bush and placed on the head of his victor, the new King of England, Henry VII. Ah. If true, this crown would not have been St. Edward's, but a battle crown or decorated helmet. Henry's genealogical claim to the throne was rather dubious, so he and his descendants worked hard to impress their majesty and authority upon their subjects. The Tudors took to wearing royal crowns on even more occasions, including Christmas, Epiphany, Easter, Whitsum, All Saints Day, the Feast of St. Edward, and at the annual state opening of Parliament. In 1509, Henry VIII added a new object to the regalia, the orb representing- Oh, the Henry VIII was the one that added the orb. Okay. Presenting the monarch's authority over the Christian world. Okay, that's that's interesting because it's like 
So the crown represents a halo, which basically gives uh, divine authority to rule. The scepter is basically represents the religious authority. And the orb is the, how did she say that exactly? Uh, a new object to the regalia, the orb representing the monarch's authority over the Christian world. The monarch's authority over the Christian world. In, in a way, all three of them are kind of not really interchangeable, but they kind of represent the same thing, it seems like. Divine authority to rule, uh, religious leadership, and leadership over Christi Christians, I guess. I mean, it's kind of, isn't that kind of the same thing in a, in a way? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm missing some context there. But I definitely was wondering what these meant, so glad she went into that. World. In 1603, the first Stuart King, James I, added three swords, representing the monarch's power in the administration swords. of justice. I haven't seen the those. The sword of spiritual justice, the sword of temporal justice, and the blunt sword of mercy. He enshrined the heredity of the crown jewels into English law, but his son, Charles I, did not agree. He was broke, and one of his first acts on the throne was to pack up 41 masterpieces from the jewel house onto a ship headed for Amsterdam, the hub of Europe's jewel trade. Oh. These okay. works of art include the three brothers, three rectangular red spinels arranged around a central diamond with pearl accents, wow. and the mirror of Great Britain, four pale diamonds and a red ruby arranged in a diamond pattern. These treasures were expected to enrich the king by 300,000 pounds, but they fetched only 70,000 pounds. Much the money would that be today? have not been seen since and are now considered lost. Oh, wow. King Charles was eager to get his hands on more money, so he worked out schemes to tax his people without the consent of Parliament. Parliament was naturally furious, and in 1642, a civil war broke out between the king's supporters, called the Cavaliers, and the parliamentarians, known as the Roundheads. Queen Henrietta Maria traveled to the continent to secure loans for her husband's army. But when it was discovered that she had used even more of the crown jewels as collateral, the English were outraged. Parliament decreed that from then on, the crown jewels were owned by the crown and were only lent to the individual monarch. Okay. King Charles lost the civil war and his head in 1649. England was taken over by General Oliver Cromwell, oh, who utterly Cromwell. destroyed the crown jewel collection, which he called symbolic of the detestable rule of kings and monuments of superstition and idolatry. Okay, Cromwell. I've heard of Cromwell, but I didn't really know his you know, impact in British history. I've definitely got to remember to look into him. Uh, he would be an interesting figure, it sounds like. So this is when, basically, there was a time in British history that they were kind of done with the king for a little while, it sounds like. And he actually destroyed the crown jewels of the time? Because this, honestly, it kind of looks similar to the current crown, if I remember correctly. Hmm. The gemstones were removed and mm. sold to pay war debts, and the gold and silver was melted down to mint coins for the new republic, wow. which were stamped with Cromwell's face, warts and all. So common people walking the streets of London in the 1650s were buying pints of beer with tiny pieces of St. Edward's crown and wow. the other vestments of ancient kingship. Wow. Cromwell declined to be declared king, preferring the title Lord Protector. But he was a king in all but name. I started to say he his he he literally allowed his face to be on the coin. I mean, uh, so it's almost like he wanted to have a little of authority. He wanted to have power, but he didn't want to look looked like he was trying to take that power. I don't know. That's kind of interesting. Definitely an interesting figure I need to look into. Is Cromwell, I don't understand, if is Cromwell looked at as a positive or a negative figure in British history? 
I guess I could see it going both ways, depending on how people, especially felt at the time about the monarch. And a very strict puritanical one at that. Oh. He cracked down on the country's morality, shuttered theaters and brothels, oh. demanded that everyone go to church and stay sober, and even canceled Christmas. So he, he For did. For the common people, he had life king. wasn't any better under a king masquerading as a lord protector. When Cromwell died in 1660, one of those monuments of superstition and idolatry, a crown was placed on his coffin. Rather than wow. bow to Cromwell's uncharismatic son, Richard, who, like a king, had been appointed Lord Protector after his father, the people... Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So... He had, this whole time he's like, yeah, we're not going to do the king thing anymore. We're gonna we're gonna get rid of the crown and and we're not going to have a king because you know this is outdated or whatever, right? But you're literally you literally acted like the king in every other way, and then you passed down power to your son like he was a king as well. Like what? Okay, I've definitely got to look into this guy, man. <laughs> Oh, man, if anybody knows any good videos to kind of learn more about Cromwell or that type, that time of history specifically. And uh, yeah, please let me know in the comments. Decided they just as well have the real thing back. Right. OK. So they invited King Charles the first son to become King Charles the ah, second. Okay. The new king was thrilled to have his father's throne back. But the royal coffers were empty, so he didn't have any splendid ancient crowns or jewels to adorn himself with. Only four items from the medieval collection survived Cromwell's meltdown <laughs> and were returned to the king. They were a silver gilt anointing spoon from the 12th century reign of King Henry II, which is the oldest piece in the modern collection. Oh, wow. And the three swords of spiritual justice, temporal justice, and mercy from the reign of King James I. In order to curry favor with the new King of England, the Dutch ambassador and other royals and nobles who had purchased pieces from Cromwell returned what gemstones could be found, oh. but no other complete pieces were recovered. From these, plus an additional 12,184 pounds, seven shillings, and tuppence, the royal goldsmith created a new set of crown jewels, which were fashioned to look as much like the medieval set as anyone wow. could remember. There was a new St. Edward's crown, two scepters, an orb, an ampulla to hold holy anointing oil, a pair of spurs, a pair of arm mills, and a walking stick, all of which were used in the coronation of King Charles II in 1661. He also purchased or was presented with several pieces of altar and banqueting plate, all of which form the core of the modern crown jewel collection. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is... The stuff that I saw as the crown jewels is actually more than I actually thought. Wow. Okay. And when was that? 16. Oh, man. When was that? Uh, I don't even remember when they said it. It was 16 something, right? Wow. Look at that. That is, those are amazing pieces of, I don't know, art. That's what I would call they, this art to me. This is. It's just beautiful, beautiful pieces of gold art. Wow. After the coronation, the new crown jewels were locked in a cupboard in the Tower of London. Tourists could request that the deputy keeper of the jewel house show them this treasure trove for a small fee. Shockingly, one of these tourists, a man called Thomas Blood, hit the 77-year-old deputy on the head and made off with a crown, a scepter, and an orb. Oh, wow. When Blood was apprehended by the police a few hours later, the jewels were recovered. 
The crown had been flattened with a mallet in an attempt to conceal it, and there was a dent in the orb. But the pieces were repaired, and the crown jewels have been kept under state-of-the-art security and 24-hour guard ever since. Wow. Many more pieces have been added to the crown jewel really? collection over the years. In 1685, Mary of Modena, the wife of King James II, was the first queen consort crowned since the Restoration. So a new crown and set of regalia was created for her. When Mary II and William III were crowned joint sovereigns in 1689, no one was sure which of them should wear St. Edward's crown, so they had two new crowns made instead. Subsequent monarchs decided to be crowned with smaller state crowns rather than the extremely heavy, migraine-inducing St. Edward's crown. Yeah, that looks Saint heavy. St. Edward's was placed on a cushion on the altar during those I wonder how heavy that is. The Georgian kings were big spenders and often didn't have cash to buy enough diamonds for their crowns. So they would borrow diamonds from the royal jewelers at a 4% fee to be set in their crowns during the coronation. Afterward, the diamonds and jewels would be replaced with glass or paste stones for display in the Tower of London. Oh, King wow. George IV was an especially careless spender. He ordered three new crowns for his over-the-top 1821 coronation. Meanwhile, he locked his wife, Caroline of Brunswick, out of the abbey. Luckily, the king was now legally barred from selling off the historic pieces of the crown jewel collection, because King George IV likely would have held a rummage sale to pay off his many gambling debts. By the time of Queen Victoria, the British Empire had enriched itself through colonization and the subjugation of many other countries and people. The diamonds in the crown jewels were real. Many other priceless gemstones were presented and gifted to the British monarchs and were added to the crown jewel collection. These include the many pieces of the Cullinan diamond or Star of Africa and the Kohinoor diamond from India. In 1843, Victoria issued a royal warrant to Gerard and Co, making them the official crown jewelers. They are responsible for maintenance and security wow. of the collection and create any new pieces That's the royal insane. family requests. In 1911, George V decided to be crowned with that ancient symbol of English kingship, St. Edward's crown. In the lead up to World War I, he was eager to distance himself from his German relatives and associate the monarchy with its ancient British roots. During the Second World War, the Tower of London was bombed by the Nazis, and the crown jewels were secretly moved to Windsor Castle. The most valuable gemstones were taken out of their settings, sealed in a biscuit tin, and hidden in the castle's basement. After the war, the jewels were kept in a vault in the Bank of England, while the jewel house, which had been struck by a bomb, was repaired. In 1953, St. Edward's crown was placed on the head of Queen Elizabeth II at her coronation. And wow. the imperial state crown is taken out every year for Her Majesty's opening of Parliament. Though the 95-year-old queen now prefers that the heavy crown remain on a cushion rather than on top of her head. I would, I would expect Today, so. Today, the 142 pieces of the crown jewel collection are on permanent display at the Tower of London, where they are seen by two and a half million visitors each year. Wow. They are cleaned each January by crown jeweler Mark Appleby, who is also on hand to ensure the jewels are shining their brightest when worn by the royals for special occasions. The crown jewels remain a dazzling and tangible tie between the modern monarchy and their ancient ancestors. They wait quietly for the coronation of the next British monarch, wow. during which they will be used in the only ceremony of its kind left in Europe. In next week's video, we will look inside the jewel house and take a peek at the individual pieces which comprise the British Crown Jewel collection. 
these 16 crowns, six scepters, three robes, six. two orbs, wow. and various other priceless treasures each have a fascinating history wow. and significance, as do many of the spectacular jewels they hold. Wow. Let me just say, I don't think I could have found a better video to watch to learn about the crown jewels. This was absolutely the hands down, I think, the best overview of the history of the crown jewels that I could have found. Uh, wow. So in depth. She did such a great job at this. Um, uh, wow. There, <laughs> there's just so much more here than I thought. I was under the impression, like before Queen Elizabeth II's funeral, I didn't really even know anything about the crown jewels at all. I, I Someone tell me the crown jewels, I would have thought, yeah, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's a ring and the crown. I, you know, I, I had no clue. You know, I had never looked into any of that. So, uh, you know, then I saw the orb, the crown and the scepter, and I was told that those were the crown jewels. Now I watch this video and... There's so much more to the crown jewels. They're swords, uh, like some sort of, what do they call it? The spoon, I don't even know where it's at. Oh, wait, here it is. The anointing spoon. Um, you know, I guess are the robes considered crown jewels? I know she mentioned them briefly. I mean, do the robes themselves have some sort of jewels on them? This was so interesting. Wow, and... I assumed that before this, I assumed that the, you know, the crown, the orb and scepter was kind of like always on the queen or king's possess, uh, you know, person. I was assumed they had them with them, maybe not carrying them with them, but I thought they were like, you know, I think maybe uh, the Tower of London video. I haven't really looked inside of the Tower of London, but I learned about the history of it. And in that video, uh, in the comments, someone was telling me that's where the crown jewels were kept. But before that, I just assumed that they were like, um, you know, in the in the castle with the queen or king. Um, but this is so interesting. And I assumed that the those three things, the orb, the scepter and the crown, not only did I assume that was all of the crown jewels, I also assumed that was the original ones. So I find it's really interesting how you've had them just come and go, disappear, change throughout the centuries. Um, but wow. And, uh, you know, she went through the history of the scepter and the, I mean, the meaning of the scepter, the crown and the orb. And so that's something I definitely wanted to know. I'm going to definitely watch the next video. Uh, because that'll actually give me a better look, I'm guessing, at the individual items because it's inside the jewel house itself, right? Um, and that's something I definitely want to see. And hoping they'll go into she'll go into the value of these items because I'd just like to know what what the monetary value of these are because it's just interesting to me. Not that anybody would ever sell them, obviously, but just how much is that crown, for example, worth. I mean, it looks absolutely amazing. Um, but wow, I learned so much in this video. Um, yeah, so <laughs> anyways, guys, thank you so much for stopping by. Please click that like button. Feel free to drop your comments or suggestions about this video or other things you think I might want to check out. And don't forget to subscribe to continue to follow me on my journey to discover my British and Irish ancestry. Until next time, guys. Peace.